Hey guys, let's dive into our study about lament. And I think one of the best ways to kind of expose ourselves to this is to grab some of these laments from the Bible and just take a look at how they voice their concerns, how they use language to give voice to the complaint that they want to bring before God. We'll see that there is this reoccurring motif that happens in some laments. And if I'm honest, it's it's pretty jarring language for prayer. So are, are you ready? Are, are you prepared to hear the laments in the Bible? So before we look at some specific laments, I wanted to grab this from the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. This statement kind of stopped me in my tracks. It says, there is a strong element of protest in many lament psalms, with the poet, in effect, chastising God for not having corrected a terrible injustice and sometimes charging God with being asleep. Wow. Um, have you ever prayed a prayer uh, protesting something to God in your life and you accuse God of being asleep? Is that okay to pray? What is this? Is, is this something that we should celebrate? Are we allowed to pray like this? Are these faithless prayers? Or are these faithful prayers? Well, let's take a look and maybe we can sense a pattern here. So we're going to be looking at these psalms and these excerpts from the prophets who are lamenting where God seems absent or maybe even asleep in their lives. Feel free to pause any of these readings and you can read the whole psalm. Some of these are are, are pretty extended. Some of them are are, are fairly short. But to read the, the whole prayer... Uh, is helpful. But I'm going to highlight a couple of components uh, as we go along. One of the components I'm going to highlight are these accusations of God being asleep. I'm also going to highlight something else we need to keep in mind in the context of these lament songs of protest, songs of chastising God, songs of accusing him of being asleep. The poets also do something else. So we'll take a look at that too. So let's start with Psalm 7 verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. And and so we see here that this kind of charged language of the lament is in the context of injustice. Here we have David discussing a situation in which he feels like justice has not been served. Let's look at Psalm 35, another prayer of David. O Lord, you know all about this. Do not stay silent. Do not abandon me now, O Lord. Wake up. Rise to my defense. Take up my case, my God and my Lord. Again, this prayer is in the context of David uh, praying for vindication and defense in the face of enemies. Is it okay to talk to God like this? Psalm 44. This is composed by the sons of Korah, and they have this lament about the state of Israel in relation to their military campaigns, that they're, they're not doing so great. There's, there's a lack of victory. They're experiencing defeat, and they raise their prayer to God on, on, on behalf of the, the whole nation. After this kind of uh, refresher of, of God's historical relationship with, with them, giving them victory, they petition this way. They, again, accuse God of being asleep. They say, wake up, O Lord. Why do you sleep? Get up. Do not reject us forever. Why do you look the other way? Why do you ignore our suffering and oppression? We collapse in the dust, lying face down in the dirt. Rise up. Help us. Ransom us because of your unfailing love. And that's how the psalm closes. A raw plea for God to intervene on their behalf. Uh, Psalm 59, and this one's from David, and the subtitle says, when Saul had sent men to watch David's house in order to kill him. So this was under threat of death. This is high stakes. 
David is praying to God. He says, I've done nothing wrong, yet they prepare to attack me. Wake up! See what is happening and help me! So, guys, I just want to ask you to ruminate on this a little bit. To hear the, the language of these psalms, the, the, these people that felt as if God was asleep to their plight, like, like he was sleeping on the clock. Have you ever felt that way about anything in, in your life? Let's be honest. Sometimes we, we might feel this way. And we might be tempted to pray this way. And what I'm learning is that that is not a faithless prayer. To pray with such urgency. To ask God to wake up. Maybe, maybe some of us feel like God has been asleep for all of 2020. Like, where is this going? Here we are in 2021, and we've been through so much as a, as a nation, as, as a church family, and as individuals. And I just want to encourage you, if you've, if you felt at all, at all, uh, a nagging sense that, that, that you felt, at least felt, and we're going to talk about this more, but at least felt like God was asleep. I just want to encourage you. You're in a long-standing tradition of people who have prayed to God and actually voiced to God that very feeling. Let's take a look at how the prophets have added to this picture. It seems here in Isaiah, this motif resurfaces and if I'm reading this correctly, it's in a block of text that begins in chapter 50 that says this is what the Lord says, and then it's kind of a lot of quote lines all the way through to this point. And so it seems like even God himself is is allowing the prophet to kind of wrap his head around this particular language of urgency here in 51, 9 through 10. Wake up! Wake up, O Lord! Clothe yourself with strength, flex your mighty right arm. Rouse yourself as in the days of old when you slew Egypt, the dragon of the Nile. Are you not the same today, the one who dried up the sea, making a path of escape through the depths so that your people could cross over? We see this with Moses in Exodus. We see this in Habakkuk. And we see it here, this kind of prophetic prayer that actually seeks to remind God who he is, if we may be as bold to do so. So this, wake up, God, you're this amazing God who can do these amazing things. This can be a part of our prayer life. Let's close with Zechariah. Again, kind of couched in a section here in Zechariah 2.10, there is a declares the Lord statement, and then there's a bunch more uh, quotation marks. So uh, here we have what seems to be through Zechariah, God speaking through the same kind of motif, the same kind of category of thought and prayer. He says, Let all humanity be silent before the Lord, for from his holy dwelling he has roused himself. And so, whether this is simply anthropomorphic language, you guys familiar with that term? We could really get into this if you wanted to. In Exodus chapter 32, the covenant name of God, there's a description of God in Hebrew, Erek Af, which means long of nose. And this is another one of those things where we encounter the utility of studying the, the language concept world of the original context and the original cultures through which God revealed himself. And so whereas we might associate long nose with, yeah, you guessed it, we usually think of long nose as being dishonest thanks to the influence of the very strange tale of Pinocchio. In the Hebrew concept, it's almost like a nose was a, a thermometer, right? And so when you, the word for anger is actually nose. And so when someone is uh, short of nose, their, their nose burns. It gets angry. It gets red really quickly. Right? But if someone was long of nose, it means that they were a patient person. They were slow to anger. Long of nose. In this, we have an anthropomorphism. 
So, uh, 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 we've, we've, we've read already, right, the, the use of metaphor, that God's arm, did, did God's arm literally, like, dip out of the sky and, like, part the Red Sea? Well, you know, the people that were there experienced it as, uh, as wind, right? So, uh, it's, it's concepts, uh, an arm being a symbol of strength, uh, a nose being a symbol of, of patience here, slow to anger, that these anthropomorphisms kind of help us wrap our minds around, uh, around relating to God. He's an interpersonal being, and yes, he is, he is eternal, and, and he is not confined. Uh, he, he is who he is, and, and, and we're not to make idols of him because somehow... He's decided to represent himself through humanity. We are made in his image. And so for us to be able to understand this ineffable, beautiful, eternal, invisible God, he gives us language to be able to understand and relate to him in ways that we uh, can feel, that we can communicate, and, and that we can wrap our own feeble minds and hearts around so that we can understand and have a deep relationship with him. So here, through the prophets, through the prayers of the psalmist, these poetic laments uh, are, are pulling on a motif that God himself picks up and uses that describes this feeling of alienation that we have when we are at odds with things, when things are going poorly for us, when things are oppressive and we're like, why is it like this? That in those moments... We can reach for this particular anthropomorphism in our prayer. That we can ask God to wake up. Do you hear this? Do you hear how God can open up a way for us to communicate how we really feel to him? And he's responsive to that. And when we do that, when we're really honest, when we really voice the complaint, when we really candidly tell God how we feel, something happens. And the poets of these laments teach us how to walk through this. Because these laments don't simply contain an accusation of God being asleep. They also state their trust and God's attentiveness and character. So... Let's circle back around, shall we? In Psalm 7, David, remember, feeling as if the scenario he was in was one of injustice, that God was ignoring his injustice, closes with this statement of faith. He says, I will thank the Lord because he is just and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So here, even in the middle of him saying, wake up, God, aren't you going to do justice for me? He's stating his trust in God. So we can hold these things together in our lament. What other prayer gives us the ability to be this honest and this hopeful? Psalm 35, let's circle back around to that one. Again, this is David who's, who is surrounded. He feels surrounded and, and, and he needs God to, to wake up and, and, and to help him in, in battle. And the psalm closes with this. But give great joy to those who came to my defense. It seems that David's been at least partially answered. Let them continually say, Great is the Lord who delights in blessing his servant with peace. Then I will proclaim your justice and I will praise you all day long. Do you hear the trust here? Do you hear this ease of, of, of moving in our, in our language from God, wake up, help me to I'm going to praise you. Can we hold this together? Lament gives us language to do so. L language to voice complaint. And language to act in hope. Radical, nearly impossible hope. And remember this song from the sons of Korah that closed with, with a plea for God to wake up in the, in the middle of, of, of a national feeling of defeat. Tucked away in here is this statement of confidence and willingness to worship God. It says, O oh God, we give glory to you all day long and constantly praise your name. And there's an interlude here. They're supposed to ruminate on this. They're supposed to praise God. But now you have tossed us aside in dishonor. You no longer lead our armies to battle. 
Do you hear how the complaint and the praise merge in the Psalms, in the prayers, in the, in the, in the poetry of lamentation? And here, as David is fleeing, fleeing from, from p- potential murderers, hopeful assassins from Saul, he closes with this incredible statement in his faith and God. He says, but as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. Oh, my strength, to you I sing praises. For you, oh God, you are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. So even while David is is praying in fear of his life. God, wake up, wake up, I'm being pursued. There's assassins after me. I don't know if any of our troubles are that severe. So maybe, maybe it's right for David to say, wake up, God, I've kind of got some assassins after me. Here, he closes his lamentation with a statement about God's character, his unfailing love and his attentiveness and responsiveness to David's prayer in his life. So what other tool in the, in the prayers of the Bible gives us the language to be able to walk to God with our most honest and raw and even accusatory, right? That word chastising, it's, it's like, God, where were you? Come on, wake up. That we can walk to God and, and, and put that on the table and bring it to Him and be that raw and in the same breath find within ourselves a, a, a guidance to interact with and to prop up and to, to, to hold on to the character of God and state our trust in Him. So how are we to chew on this particular challenging imagery from these songs. If we're going to encounter the laments and we're going to try to learn how to lament, we encounter this, the sleeping God motif. What do we do with it? Well, let me return back to the dictionary of biblical imagery for a helpful comment. The sleeping God motif appears in the Bible in context of individual or national oppression picture God as needing to be awakened thus expresses human emotion rather than a theological fact about God. And as we've explored this idea of anthropomorphism, uh, that, that, that we can use these categories of thinking, yeah, God, God isn't asleep. You can look elsewhere in the Psalms. You know, we went through the Songs of Ascent not too long ago. And here we have in Psalm 121, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Verse 4, indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Keep this in mind. I'm not telling you that you should believe that God is asleep. Actually, if you want an interesting detour, there's an interesting Canaanite God that people believed fell asleep every time the rain was gone. Let's have a little detour, shall we? So this is the tale of Baal. Baal was this god who every season got trapped by this other god at a dinner party and couldn't make it back. Baal as a storm god, kind of a personified rain cloud, ended up being stuck in the underworld and then having to re-escape in order to bring the rains and he got tricked every time the season changed. That is a pretty dumb god. So, how are we to interpret that the language of the laments are this sleeping god motif? Are they using this kind of pagan concept and, and, and actually believing that God is asleep? I don't think that's the case. I think the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery really captures it. Just as we've talked about this concept of anthropomorphism, using a, a human relational component to kind of understand God, like God's nose or God's arm, God's absence. It feels like you're asleep. And that's the thing. What the lament psalms do is they free up language and emotion to be poured 
not just for our own hearts or uh, talking about it to each other or posting online, but to pour that emotion, that real raw stuff, even complaint, even chastising. It's all redeemed if we point it to God. And I think that's really the point of this, that we can really express our emotions to God. He welcomes that. The language of the laments show us that he welcomes it. He does something to to the heart of the person praying with such raw emotion. So can we challenge ourselves to pray like that? Can we challenge ourselves to really, truly dump out our emotions to God and truly voice our complaint, even with jarring language? So let me read from Walter Brueggemann. I I really love his work on the Psalms. The function of such complaint speech is to create a situation that did not exist before the speech, to create an external event that matches the internal sensitivities. It is the work of such speech to give shape, power, visibility, authenticity to the experience. So let me just pause right there for a moment. What you felt last year, what you're feeling now, it's real and it deserves to be honored in prayer. Give that internal event shape by bringing it, externalizing it to God in prayer. Let's continue. The authentic artist is not focusing on old events for review, but is in fact committing an act of hope. I'm going to read that one again the authentic artist is not focusing on old events for review but is in fact committing an act of hope thus the complaint psalms of disorientation do their work of helping people to die completely to the old situation the old possibility the old false hopes the old lines of defense and pretense to say as dramatically as possible that is all over now Guys, use language to match where you are. Use language to match your experience. Be honest, be candid, be real, be raw, even be chastising in your prayer toward God. My hope, as I see in in the life of David through these Psalms, that it does something to our hearts when we're raw and real with God. The voicing of complaint is accompanied by the reminder of who God is and a choice to believe in his character, to believe in his power, to believe in his attentiveness to our prayer. That is what makes lament an act of hope. So would you bring it all and voice your complaint to God? And while you find this language, as I do, a bit hard to swallow, is it okay if we talk to God like that? I think what we can see here is that anything that we bring to the surface, our emotions, that we direct at God, when all this raw stuff, this jarring language, this chastising language, this language of protest and urgency, wake up when that meets trust in who God is. That is a robust prayer and that is part of lament and that is what makes lament an act of hope. So I challenge you this week to write again a new lament and free up your language a bit. Would you truly complain? Would you truly articulate how you feel to God? Believe in his character as you do it.